Now my honor to introduce to you the honorary doctoral candidate, President Barack Hussein Obama in absentia. <laughs> the ambassador is a good substitute. <laughs> President Barack Hussein Obama became the 44th President of the United States of America in 2009. President Obama has had an illustrious career. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University in 1981. He then entered Harvard Law School in 1988, where he was appointed editor of the Harvard Law Review at the end of his first year. In his second year, he became the first ever black president of that journal. He worked as an associate at law firms during university holidays. In 1991, he graduated with a Juris Doctorate degree, magna cum laude. In 1991, Obama accepted a two-year position as visiting law and government fellow at the University of Chicago Law School to work on his first book. He taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago Law School for 12 years, first as a lecturer from 1992 to 1996, and then as a senior lecturer from 1996 to 2004. In 1993, President Obama joined the firm of attorneys specializing in civil rights litigation and neighborhood economic development, where he was an associate for three years, from 1993 to 1996, and then counsel from 1995 to 2004. Throughout his career, he has demonstrated his exceptional commitment to community work and used the law as a tool to improve the lives of ordinary Americans. His presidency brought the hope of changing the climate of international relations. It created the opportunity to strengthen international diplomacy and to increase cooperation between peoples and raise the hope of a world without nuclear arms. The international community looked forward to his country recognizing the role that the United Nations and other international institutions can play in resolving even the most difficult international conflicts by dialogue and negotiations. The world also looked forward to the United States under his leadership playing a more constructive role in meeting the greater, great climatic challenges the world is confronting. It looked forward to that country providing the leadership to strengthen democracy and human rights all over the world. Accordingly, President Obama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009. After assuming office, President Obama issued executive orders and presidential memoranda directing the United States military to develop plans to withdraw troops from Iraq. 
He ordered the closing of Guantanamo Bay detention camp, but Congress prevented the closure by refusing to appropriate the required funds and preventing moving any Guantanamo Bay detainee into, into the United States or to other countries. President Obama appointed two women to serve on the Supreme Court in the first two years of his presidency, including the first ever Hispanic Supreme Court Justice. Following these appointments, three of the nine judges of the Supreme Court are women, the highest proportion ever in American history. Obama reduced the secrecy status given to presidential records. His administration provided new regulations on power plants, factories, and oil refineries in an attempt to limit greenhouse gas emissions and to curb global warming. He signed an act that extended the federal hate crime law to include crimes motivated by a victim's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. He also signed an act to fulfill a promise he made in the 2008 presidential campaign to end the don't ask, don't tell policy of 1993 that had prevented gay and lesbian people from serving openly in the United States Armed Forces. He instructed agencies to consider laws affecting lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people when issuing financial aid to foreign countries. In 2013, the Obama administration filed briefs which urged the Supreme Court to rule in favor of same-sex couples in two cases before it. In 2010, Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Health Care Act, commonly called Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, and also commonly known as Obama's health care reform. This federal statute represents the most significant government expansion and regulatory overhaul of the U.S. health care system since the mid-1960s. In March 2010, Obama took a public stance against plans by the Israeli government to continue with controversial housing projects in East Jerusalem. During the same month, an agreement was reached with the administration of the Russian president to replace the 1991 Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty with a new pact reducing the number of long-range nuclear weapons in the arsenals of both countries by about one-third. The new treaty was signed in April 2010 and ratified by the US Senate in December 2010. Although the United States, States is not at present a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, it has, under Obama's leadership, engaged with state parties to the Rome Statute on issues of concern. It is willing to consider assistance in response to specific requests from the International Criminal Court, prosecutor, and other court officials, if consistent with US law and when it is in the national interest of the US to do so. Under his leadership, the United States is working to strengthen national justice systems and supports ad hoc international tribunals and hybrid courts which seek to hold those accountable who internationally target innocent <coughs> civilians. Since 2009, the United States has participated in an observer capacity in meetings of the ICC Assembly of States Parties. The United States sent an observer delegation to the ICC Review Conference held in Kampala, Uganda from May 31st to June 11th, 2010. Furthermore, the United States under Obama's leadership announced that will soon join the more than 65 countries which have already signed a landmark treaty regulating the multi-million dollar global arms trade. Considering that the United States produces more arms than any other country in the world, this will contribute greatly 
to the first major international campaign to stem the illicit trade in weapons that fuels conflicts and supplies extremists. The university's vision, ladies and gentlemen, is to be an international university of choice anchored in Africa, dynamically shaping the future. Our mission is to support this vision and it's to inspire its community to transform and serve humanity through innovation and the collaborative pursuit of knowledge. The values which underpin this vision and mission are imagination, conversation, regeneration, and an ethical foundation. President Obama has demonstrated distinguished social and intellectual achievement related to the university's vision, mission, values, and strategic goals, and thus is a worthy recipient of the degree Dr. Legum, Doctor of Law, Honoris Causa. Chancellor, I now request you to confer the degree Dr. Hadoum, Doctor of Law, Honoris Causa on Barack Hussein Obama. So this was, as you can imagine, one of the most difficult matters, both inside the university and in the White House. And after much deliberation within the Senate of the University, as well as within the White House, and clearly with the concurrence of President Barack Obama, the university has complied with all of the requirements to award this qualification. I should say to the ambassador before I award it, that uh, President Obama has personally committed as an alumnus of the University of Johannesburg to contribute to its internationalization profile. And he has communicated this to me personally, so I will engage with him uh, following the award of the qualification uh, to see how the University of Johannesburg, its uh, academics and its students can um, uh, derive uh, through this relationship of ours um, uh, opportunities um, for exchange and for building and growing their networks with leading universities of the United States of America. And so it is with great joy that I now, with the powers vested in me, confer the degree Doctor Legum Honoris Causa also known as Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa on Barack Hussein Obama in absentia. Chancellor, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. And in this regard, I'd like to introduce the United States Ambassador to South Africa, Mr. Patrick Gaspard, to you. Prior to being appointed U.S. Ambassador to South Africa, Patrick Gaspard served as the Executive Director of the Democratic National Committee, a position he held since 2011. Previously, he served as an assistant to the President and Director of the Office of Political Affairs from 2009 to 2011. Prior to that, he was the National Political Director for Obama for America. He served as the Executive Vice President and Political Director for the Service Employees International <coughs> Union. And in 2004, he served as National Field Director for America Coming Together. 
and from 2003 to 2004, he was the National Deputy Field Director for DU for America. From 1998 to 1999, he was the Chief of Staff for the New York City Council. Earlier in his career, Mr. Gaspard held a number of positions with the City of New York, including Special Assistant in the Office of the Manhattan Borough President and the Special Assistant in the Office of Mayor Dingens. Ambassador, thank you very much. Please come to the podium. Thank you. Good evening. Sani Bonani. I have to say that um, as I listened to the recitation of my president's record, it was clear to me that as I took the podium, I might be a little emotional. Uh, I've uh, been with Barack Obama for a lengthy period of time now. I first got to know our president in 2004 and knew immediately that he was someone who had the ability to take incredibly complicated ideas, complicated policy notions that had caused deep divides in our society for generations, uh, and to make them accessible uh, to the American people in a way that spoke to our very best aspirational nature. Uh, and uh, I knew immediately that this was someone who would do uh, great things, uh, and uh, it would be uh, the honor of my lifetime uh, to uh, be in his service and in the service of my country. As you recited uh, his accomplishments, uh, I, um, uh, I found myself catching my breath when you talked about uh, health care and when you talked about uh, don't ask, don't tell, two things that I was personally uh, quite uh, invested in. When we passed the health care law and enabled uh, poor people in our country to get access to care, who had been previously uh, denied uh, access. And when we passed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, for the first time, uh, men and women could serve our country openly, uh, freely, the country that they loved, irrespective of whom they personally loved uh, at, at home. Uh, it had enormous impact uh, on me. Uh, and I realized then uh, that President Obama fulfilled a personal promise uh, that he made to me. Uh, when he first decided that he was going to run uh, for the presidency, when he was still a U.S. Senator, uh, he was uh, twisting my arm a little to try to convince me to be his national political director, uh, and I kept uh, avoiding him and deferring. He finally cornered me one day uh, in his uh, office, and he said, Gaspard, what's wrong with you? Why won't you come and work for me? Don't you think I'll win? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm confident of your ability to be successful, but there are two things that I'm doing. One, I'm organizing a national health care campaign for uh, coalition of unions, and I've got two young children who I need to be able to spend some time with, and I can't uh, be chasing you around the country for the next two years. He looked at me, and he laughed, that confident laugh of his, uh, and he said, Gaspard, if you come and work for me, and you go on this quest and this journey with me, I promise you that we will get health care done much faster than you and your little friends can if you organize for the next decade. Uh, and I also promise you that the day that I stand on the steps of the U.S. Capitol, steps that were finished with the hands of slave labor, and I put my hand on the Lincoln Bible and I take the oath of office, the lives of your two children of color will be appreciably more improved than if you spent every single one of the next uh, few days with them over the course of the next year. He had me at hello. So <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I will always uh, be uh, enormously proud of uh, uh, that service. So I hope you'll forgive me uh, for going off of my prepared remarks and speaking extemporaneously for a moment uh, because uh, you may be quite emotional uh, as you walk through um, a little bit of my life. <clears throat> so thank you, Vice Chancellor and Principal, <clears throat> members of the Executive Committee, distinguished guests, law school faculty, parents, loved ones, uh, and of course, most especially, the outstanding class of 2014. It is the greatest privilege to join you on this unique occasion on behalf of my friend, my dear leader, President Barack Obama, in order to receive this extraordinary honor which you have seen fit to bestow upon him. President Obama delivered an address at UJ Soweto campus one year ago this month 
but was not able to participate in this ceremony at the time. I hope that I make a suitable stand-in today. Though I'm considerably less charismatic, utterly lacking in the President's gift for the turning of a phrase or his exceptional comedic, ti comedic timing, admittedly, the wisdoms I impart will be faint echoes of his inspirations. Vice Chancellor, I can assure you that as I speak, you will uh, get very little ululation uh, and there'll be very little uh, alleluiaic refrains. <clears throat> and most significantly, my security detail arrived here in a Mini Cooper, whilst his would have dwarfed your entire graduating class. I learned uh, very early on in my career that a man's got to know his limitations. <clears throat> All this confessed, please know that while I salute you as a proudly patriotic American, my pulse is governed by the same deeply African blood that, course that courses through my president's veins. As a son of this continent, born in the Congo of Haitian descent, I recognize what has been built in this institution and in each and every one of your lives because my orientation uh, and my sense of self-liberation is informed by Toussaint Louverture and Patrice Lumumba. As a pilgrim for democracy who traveled to your country a quarter of a century ago when places not far from here were filled with the specter of revolution and death, I know that your achievements here are nearly miraculous and are to be guarded like the, pre like the precious treasures that they are. I have to tell you, uh, just uh, last week, I, I was in a conversation with uh, one of your ambassadors uh, in Durko. I went to have a meeting in Durko. Uh, and as I uh, had an exchange uh, with one of my counterparts in Durko, uh, 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 just a unique and remarkable figure, he was talking to me about his history in your foreign service. Uh, and it was clear that he served uh, under uh, the uh, previous regimes uh, during apartheid. And he and I discovered that we were once uh, in the same room at the same time. He had come to the United States uh, uh, back in 1986 when the South African government was trying to convince the United States government not to pass sanctions. I was all of 19 years old and I was uh, an, uh, an activist in the anti-apartheid movement working with uh, Jesse Jackson and Harry Belafonte and uh, John uh, Lewis. Uh, and uh, at the time, this uh, uh, incredible gentleman uh, went uh, on a college campus, he went to a university, uh, and uh, such a raucous and resounding sound and noise was made that he did not have the opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, and he and I discovered that we were, of course, on opposite sides of the divide then. Uh, but it speaks to the miraculous transformation that's taken place uh, in this country uh, and the uh, example that you've lifted up to the world that he and I uh, were able to uh, break bread uh, and speak to uh, the ways in which the United States and South Africa have common purpose, uh, a shared sense of uh, values, uh, and a, a shared compass going forward. So uh, this is a, 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 remarkable, a remarkable place. So it's with that unadorned insistence on respecting your place in history that I accept this honorary degree in the shadow of my president. I have yet one more confession to make uh, in this conversation. The address that I'm delivering now uh, was crafted only today at the break of dawn after I completely rejected the arc of my original draft. Commencement addresses are bracketed by such traditional expectations of exhortative language that one tends to bury the desire to express any sincere sentiments that deviates in any way from that kind of a rubric. There's a liturgical order to these things. I'm supposed to stand up here, look upon you graduates, ordain you for your absolute beauty and your brilliance, acknowledge your exceptionalism, lift up the example of a great South African jurist like George Bezos, and command you to go forth to shine your light on the Morlocks of this world. I would pull down probably an appropriate uh, classical quote, uh, probably something uh, from uh, Pindar and the Pythian Chronicles. I would look at you and I would say, um, oh my soul, do not aspire to immortal life, but exhaust the limits of the possible. And with that, I'd wrap things up succinctly, we'd get a set of applause, and we'd send you off uh, on your merry way. There really isn't that much uh, room for nagging doubts uh, in commencement addresses. While your parents, who uh, pay dearly for the privilege, can trust 
uh, that I will do some version of all of the above, there's a different emotion that quickens my heart rate today. Uh, all of that was in the draft I shredded last night. In the spirit of the transparency that I often preach, I have to share with you that I composed this version today with the fire of a righteous anger burning in me and a clear-eyed sense that I actually don't want to be here right now. I don't want to be here. I want to be with you, but I don't want to be here. All of this needs explaining. And since the plain-spoken American statesman Benjamin Franklin reminded all diplomats a very long uh, time ago that anything begun in anger ends in shame, I'll dutifully write my course before uh, leaving the stage. But first, some context for this anger. I've now been uh, in your remarkable country for a full eight months as uh, your uh, US ambassador. My journey here was both unremarkable and unbelievable. Unremarkable in logical, cumulative experiences and incremental career advancements. Unbelievable in the backdrop of the historic transformations in my country and yours in the shortest spans of time. And here we all are. I'm obliged at this point in my remarks to recite all of the achievements, uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, in our bilateral partnership uh, which are a source of uh, considerable pride, and there are many of them. We should all take heart in our joint accomplishments on health care, where through the U.S. PEPFOR program, we've significantly reduced the rate of HIV transmissions, we've protected vulnerable children, and we're working together to capacitate permanent, sustainable health care infrastructures in even the most remote uh, rural parts of uh, this country. In, in education, the U.S. Agency for International Development supports a public-private partnership with South African organizations to develop local solutions to education challenges with a real emphasis on training more effective, better equipped teachers for this next, gener next generation. When President Obama was here in June of last year, he announced his Young African Leaders Initiative, which will see 46 young South Africans join a total of 500 emerging leaders from this continent, screened from 50,000 applicants for a six-week training program in some of the finest U.S. universities to enhance their skills in entrepreneurship, public management, and civic engagement. It's more difficult for a South African to get into President Obama's YALI program uh, than it is to get into uh, the freshman class of Harvard University. On trade and investment, our relationship has grown exponentially. Through the African Growth and Opportunity Act, South Africa was able to export over $2 billion of duty-free goods to the U.S. markets in, last, in the last year alone. Over 600 American companies have planted roots here and are contributing more than 150,000 good jobs to lift up this economy. All of this is occurring as global investors get more deeply engaged in Africa as a target-rich environment with a young and hungry workforce with increasingly democratic structures. I was proud just uh, two weeks ago to have the opportunity to travel from one polling station after another to, to observe the well-executed, well-organized uh, election where South Africans were able to give clear and open expression to their preferences at the ballot box without fear of reprisal or fear of uh, voter uh, suppression. So from trade to energy to transformative governance, there's a clear uh, wind in Africa sales. And yet, and yet, here I am with an urge to race out of this hall with a righteous anger. My anger is all in the unseen and all in the undone. The harshly compromised, the unduly corrupted, the viciously silenced. I'm angry that in this era of internet activism, the best lack all conviction while all the worst are full of a passionate intensity. I'm angry that too many of our brothers and sisters will never have the opportunity that you and I have, have had to pursue excellence. I'm angry that some of you might be turn, turned away from meaningful employment because you don't have the right relatives. I'm angry that there's a radius of hunger that spreads from Detroit, Michigan, all the way here to Deep Sleuth. I'm angry that some here 
will see their talents and achievements as belonging strictly to themselves and not to their communities. I'm angry that others will look past the library that needs to be refurbished in order to instead chase further consumerism and consumption in a sea of poverty. I'm angry that our sisters in some parts of this continent can be brutally denied access to education and can be abused behind the closed doors of their own homes. Maybe I'm also angry because Lumumba's lament echoes still across the ages that our wounds are still too fresh and too painful to be forgotten, while many are complicit in the act of erasure. And I'm angry that you and I aren't outside right now instead of here, that we're not out together rolling up our sleeves in places like Tembisa and creating a microenterprise for unemployed youth or an arbitration training module for workers in Rustenburg who have gone months without a paycheck. Mine is an urgent anger, one that is measured out in conference rooms during each meandering meeting that I'm forced to suffer through, one that, will be tapped, that, that was tapped out in a metronome in my head as each of you took the stage to proudly receive your diplomas, and I sat there wondering what verse you might contribute to the tragedy. It is not an impotent anger. Anger need not be impotent. As Malcolm X slightly intoned, usually when people are sad, they don't do anything. They just cry over their condition. But when they're angry, they bring about change. The uses of anger. When Robert Kennedy visited uh, your country, visited South Africa in 1966, in angry defiance of the oppressive regime, he called South Africans to their heroic natures by invoking Pericles, who told uh, Greeks that if Athens shall appear great, know that her glory is purchased by valiant men, men who know their duty. So I say to you graduates, that as you inherit a nation that appears great, know that South Africa's glory was purchased by valiant men and, and women who sometimes had to commit brave and sometimes angry acts in the interest of your prosperity. When Barack Obama received his law degree, he accepted it as an insurance policy one that he knew meant he, was now, uh, meant he was now free to go off and take some risk in order to bring about change that he believed in. He had the credential as a safety net while he dived into civic engagement with, uh, uh, with the kind of fierce urgency of now uh, that was Dr. King's mantra. Decades later, when he returned to African shores as president of the world's most powerful democracy, he reminded all engaged with the law in African nations that, quote, at their best, our courts are venues where justice and equality can be realized for women and children and the poor, for marginalized groups, for victims of discrimination, victims of violence. But it is also a critical ingredient for economic development and prosperity in this continent. In my pocket now, and dutifully placed uh, on this podium. Uh, I have a treasured uh, photograph of my father. This is a picture from uh, the 1950s. Uh, my father is uh, resplendent in a uh, law school uh, graduation gown, uh, replete with uh, satin flourishes. He looks almost as good as you all do. He's uh, clutching, uh, seemingly for dear life, uh, in his hands, uh, the law school diploma that he had just received uh, from the finest university in the country of Haiti. Uh, the world, uh, Vice Chancellor, was very much before him uh, in that moment. But even then, even as he was receiving this diploma, uh, it was losing uh, all of its value uh, because there was a brutal dictatorship that had come into power uh, in that once proud uh, island nation. Uh, and that dictatorship was dismantling the very concept of justice. My father never got to practice his profession. Our ideals of peace and justice are ephemeral and fragile. 
There are things that uh, cannot be sustained unless we have uh, institutions and leaders uh, that are absolutely uh, independent uh, and work with that same fierce urgency of now. My father's degree was printed on stock that's equal to yours. You must prove the value of it every single day, every day, in courts, in corporate boardrooms, on township streets. What you have to ask yourself as you look at that diploma, what is in your hands, graduates? What is in your hands? Remember that in my country, Rosa Parks changed the world with nothing but a bus ticket in her hand. In your country, not far from here, young people in Sharpeville made the world pause with nothing but burning passbooks in your hands, in their hands. Surely, you have more power in your, in your hands than they had in theirs. You are the most powerful generation that has ever walked the face of the earth. In one hand, you have degrees that say that you are indeed brilliant and beautiful, and you really are. In your other hand, many of you, even now while I'm speaking, are scrolling through smartphones which concentrate more human capital in your hands than has ever been deployed in recorded history. What is in your hand? You could use your data, if you want, while you're sitting there, uh, to stream and watch yet again uh, that awesome fight between Jay-Z and Beyonce's sister. You could, you could be doing that right now. Or, you know, you could, you could go down that rabbit hole. Or you might combine that law degree and that smartphone and create a tool that completely changes the interface and accountability between civil society and your government. What is in your hands? As I come to my conclusion, my anger dissipates as I consider you in the light of what's been accomplished against the tide. You are the embodiment of the age-old contest between change and resistance and change and resistance and change and resistance. You lead me to arrive at a radical acceptance of some of our challenges while drawing inspiration from the inherent goodness of all of our collective ambitions. I recall Amy Césaire's faith towards the end of No Book of a Return to the Native Land. It is not true, he wrote, that the work of man is done, that we have no business on earth, that we parasite the world, whereas the work has only begun. And no race, no race, has a monopoly on beauty, intelligence, and on strength. And we know now that the sun turns around our earth, lighting the parcel designated by our will alone, and that every star falls from the sky to earth at our omnipotent command. Congratulations, class of 2014. I urgently await your good deeds as you arrest the heavens. <clears throat> I think I need to share that. So, there we have it. Um, I know that this has not been the shortest of ceremonies, but I hope that it's been a moment of inspiration. I can assure you that every time that I look at our graduates, you inspire me. Every time that I look at you, You honor us. Every time that I look at you, you uplift us. And so, today, with your graduation, you give us hope. You give us hope right to the core of our being that a better, a brighter, a more inclusive, a caring world awaits us. 
So, as we close the ceremony, please also accept from me warm, very warm congratulations to each one of you this evening. It would be remiss of me not to extend special congratulations to Dr. Barack Obama and also to each one of our 45 master graduates. You have heard the extraordinary theses, the range, the scope, the scale of the issues that they have examined together with their supervisors and co-supervisors. So to each one of our graduates this evening, yours is a truly outstanding and a landmark achievement. As we were reminded by Ambassador Gaspar, yes, it is for you personally, but it's also for your family, your friends, your community, indeed for all of us here at UJ, South Africa, beyond South Africa's borders where many of you come from, indeed beyond. And so today it was appropriate since you brought great honor, great prestige to your parents, many who are in the audience today, your wider family, your partners and spouses, indeed your forebears, your community, your nation, your university. Because of that, it was appropriate for us to honor you in this very special manner that we were able to, to, to do this, this evening. I want to conclude this ceremony. You see, I'm shredding as I'm going. Uh, by challenging you deeply aware, deeply aware of the obstacles that you have overcome, deeply aware of the emotions and feelings that could have crushed you, but that you overcame. Deeply aware, therefore, deeply aware that that will be the source for your inspiration in the many challenges that lie ahead. I challenge you with this UJ qualification. Go on and change the world. Be the change. Turn on its head Gandhi's assessment of the 20th century. Turn it on its head. And with this UJ qualification, go and create a 21st century characterized by commerce with morality, by politics with principles, wealth with work, science with humanity, a world of knowledge with character, a world of earth use with reverence, of religion with sacrifice, and a world of pleasure with conscience. I thank you. Rea Boa, Nyabonga, Bayadanki. <laughs>